Today we're going to study one of the most famous trials of all history, the trial of Niccolo Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti. But Sacco and Vanzetti lays bare a lot of the mythology about American society, right? It certainly shows the difference between what America is supposed to be about and what it has been in certain circumstances. This is not about Vanzetti. It's, it's not a question of whether he was guilty or innocent. It's about us. I talk about the Sacco and Vanzetti case as often as I can. Uh, you know, it's never very far from my mind. There's always something that happens in the daily newspapers that brings that case to mind. These two men could not get justice in the American system. Justice is not meted out equally to the rich and the poor, to the native-born and the foreign-born. You don't love this country, do you, Mr. Sacco? Why you say that? I am love this place. I think that the case of Sacco and Vanzetti says a lot of different things about America. It says a lot about uh, the tension that we live with constantly between individual civil liberties and collective national security and the tensions that inevitably accompany a society that's constantly renewing itself through waves of immigration, constantly having to deal with foreigners in its midst. It's a story that talks about the injustices of prejudice in a society because of the social position that you occupy. The characters of Sacco Vanzetti, the circumstances under which they suffered, as we talk about the passion of Jesus Christ. We can also call it the passion of, uh, of Sacco Vanzetti. If it had not been for these things, I might have lived out my life talking at street corners to scorning men. I might have died unmarked, unknown, a failure. Now, we are not a failure. Never in our full life could we have hoped to do such work for tolerance, for justice, for man's understanding of man as we do now by accident. Our words, our lives, our pains, nothing. The taking of our lives, all. That last moment belongs to us, that agony is our triumph. Bartolomeo Vanzetti. Vanzetti came from healthy peasant stock. His father was a fairly prosperous farmer. But unfortunately, he had no vision of his son becoming anything in life and therefore at age 13 apprenticed him as a baker's apprentice. So for the next six years in Italy, he led a wretched existence, working as much as 18 hours a day in these bakeries where he worked mainly at night. It was a terrible existence. His only solace was reading books. And the great traumatic event in his life happens when his mother dies of cancer. One sad day, my mother fell sick. But she, the family, and I suffered no pen can describe. Day and night, I remained with her, tortured by the sight of her suffering. After three months of brutal illness, she breathed her last in my arms. She died without hearing me weep. Time, far from softening my loss, made the pain more cruel. Many times going to the bridge, I stopped long and looked down at the white stones far below in a bed of sand and thought of them as a bed where there would be no more nightmares. This desperate state of mind decided me to abandon Italy for America. Questa è la casa dove è nato mio zio, è nato e vissuto qui fino alla partenza in America. È partito di qua ma non è più tornato. Sacco came from a small town in the region of Puglia called Torre Maggiore. Puglia is the heel of Italy. Unlike the vast majority of Italian immigrants who came here for reasons of poverty, 
He came from a fairly prosperous peasant family. His father owned a large vineyard. He had an olive oil business. As a kid, he liked to tinker with machines. He was never much of a scholar. Had a very happy childhood. About a 60 step from our vineyard, we have a large piece of land full of any quantity of vegetable that my brother and I, we used to cultivate them. If I was a poet, probably I could describe the red rays of the loving sun shining and the bright blue sky, the perfume of my garden and the flowers and the singing of the birds. So after all of this enjoyment, I used to come back to my work and on the way, singing, I used to fill the basket of fruit and vegetables and a bunch of flowers that I used to make a lovely bouquet. And I used to walk one mile to get one of them good red rose that I always hunting and loved to find, the good red rose, Nicola Sacco. Sono andati in America non per necessità, perché erano poveri, è solo che il sogno dei giovani era di andare in America, e lì il paese delle grandi ricchezze, il paese dell'oro. Quindi contavano di starsi in un periodo di tempo e rientrare in Italia, rientrare a Torre Maggiore. Era quasi il sogno di tutti i giovani, di andare in America era il paese dell'oro. Sacco sailed to sea one day, landed up in the Boston Bay. Fans that sailed the ocean blue and landed up in Boston too. Italian immigrants, like many immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, came to this country and got semi-skilled or unskilled industrial jobs. They're the ones who are working in the steel mills, working in heavy industry. They were often jobs that were extremely dangerous. Something along the lines of 35,000 people a year were either killed or maimed by industrial accidents. So it was an extremely dangerous place to work. The Italian was looked upon was as some kind of a, an inferior being, and there's no question about it. And there were many instances of uh, downright, blatant, ugly prejudices shown to the Italians. They were called all kinds of names, and the attitude was these people are, are different from us, and therefore, because they're different from us, we don't like them. Life for Italian immigrants was very difficult. They are coming in on the bottom rung of the economic ladder. They are viewed largely with contempt and disdain. So fitting in, acclimating into American society was very difficult. I mean, the terms Guinea, Wap, Dago, they don't appear out of nowhere. This is a reflection of the contempt with which they were viewed by mainstream American society. Arrived in America, I underwent all the suffering, the disillusions, and the privations that come inevitably to one who lands at the age of 20, ignorant of life, and something of a dreamer. Here I saw all the brutalities of life, all the injustice, the corruption in which humanity struggles tragically. Bartolomeo Vanzetti. Vanzetti went over to Meriden, Connecticut, and worked over a year in a stone quarry. And then he went from there up to work for the railroad up in Springfield as what we call a gandy dancer, working on the rails up there. And he earned his way all the way down the line, and he did tough work, hard work. Uh, this uh, building right behind us, a partial building, could be the very loading platform that uh, Vanzetti worked on. Things slowed down, so they asked him to come inside and work on piecework. So he began looking around for work, and he did what most Italian immigrants did. He got work where he could, and finally ended up deciding that he didn't want to work in factories, in dirty, stifling, dangerous factories. So he bought a push cart and began selling fish, so he could work outside and set his own hours and, and be his own boss to some extent. In many ways, he was what a lot of people held uh, most in contempt about Italian immigrants. He led a sort of unstructured life. Uh, Vanzetti lived, was renting in this house, which was the third house on the left-hand side of the street going up. In my house, the house I was living in was the first house on the right. Vanzetti, I used to see him almost every day go up and down the street with boots on, down low, you know, folded up, uh, pushing this fish cart of his, 
and they'd go in the morning, he'd go out, no fish in it, and they'd come home, he'd have one or two fish left that he claimed that he didn't sell, so they'd have them for dinner at the house. This is the Breeny home right here. And uh, this is where uh, Vangetti lived. He was almost a member of the family. They loved him here. And of course, young Beltrando Brini was, uh, you might say, his closest friend, just a little 13-year-old boy. If nothing else, I get you could say he was almost a favorite uncle, Vanzetti was, to young Beltrando. He believed in the perfectibility of human nature, something that does not, in fact, exist. That was his blind spot. He treated us with love and respect, and he treated animals the same way. Once he found a sick kitten in the street, an infection all over its face. He brought it home, kept it in a box on the porch, washed its eyes out with boric acid, and nursed it back to health. He was my ideal. For some boys, it was Ty Cobb. For me, it was Bartolomeo Vanzetti, or Trendobrini. Vanzetti era un uomo che aveva voglia di imparare. Leggeva molto. Amava Jack London, amava naturalmente eh, Cristo. Cristo per lui era un magnifico socialista. Era affascinato da quest'uomo che era morto per le sue idee. Ben Sean è uno dei più importanti americani. artists. One of my favorite images is the portrait he did of Vanzetti. If I ask someone, paint a picture in your mind of a radical, and they're probably thinking about wild gestures and um, fiery speech and mouth open and outward gestures and drama and uncontained. And here's this man, subdued, quiet, hands in his lap, in a suit. That makes him both somewhat vulnerable, but there's a dignity. Everybody describes Vanzetti as an incredibly decent human being, fundamentally a gentle soul. He's a lonely person. And it's not just his physiognomy. That droopy mustache sort of conveys a sadness and a loneliness, which I think are typical of his existence. This is Sacco's house. I wonder if they're home. <laughs> not the Sacco's, but... This is where Nicola Sacco lived with his wife and his youngster. He worked over here where that building is, that red brick building. It's the original factory is now gone, been torn down and replaced by sort of a uh, con condo situation there. He worked hard, he worked long hours. When he was working as a laborer, Nicola, out of his own pocket, paid a little extra to learn the craft of edge trimming. He made good money for those days. Here's a man who was economically successful, fitting in as best as possible to American society. Nevertheless, starting in 1912, 1913, undergoes this transformation, leading to his embracing the most radical of all political creeds. He has a tremendous empathy for the poor and the oppressed. He has this connection with those who are less fortunate than he. Sacco says, I, when I came to America, then I saw that people were not living in America, but under America. He meant the bowels of the earth, in the subterranean channels of the social strata. He was translating from the Italian. He was saying, non in America, ma sotto l'America. It sounds very dramatic in Italian, of course. It expresses it in Italian, but, but if you translate it, it says, not in America, but under America. He looks upon American society, basically American capitalist society, and says a society that allows this kind of exploitation and poverty should not be able to exist. Sacco came to the conclusion, as did Vanzetti, that the state per se, whether it's a capitalist state or a communist state, is the enemy of freedom and liberty. Consequently, of all the isms available, socialism, syndicalism, Anarchism was the ideology which 